Insightful Teaching with Jacob Prash on Moriel TV, where God is my teacher. Let's pray and ask for the Lord's blessing. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to get together and to study your word, because we know that it's not that case in many countries. And unfortunately, even in America, uh, things are getting tighter for the churches. But help us to stand up, stand firm in the faith, to continue to witness to people, because we know that's the only way they can really have a change of heart, a change of mind. Lord, I pray for Jacob that you would give him your words to say from your word today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me, please, to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Paul begins with salutations, and they're interesting salutations because he writes them jointly with Timothy. Now, when we read the epistles to Timothy, we see why. Paul is grooming the next generation to be his successor. He's grooming the next generation to be his successor. Any ministry, any church that does not have a groomed successor is likely going to have failure problems. Years, years before Moses retired, he was grooming Joshua and Caleb. It takes a long time to groom a successor. And Paul does this with Timothy and Titus to the point where he's teaching Timothy how to send epistles to churches, how to write to instruct to encourage churches that he's not physically present at and probably well, at this point, he's not been to. If he ever did, it would have been on his third missionary journey, but we can't be sure. And so he begins, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus Christ is always him on earth. Christ Jesus is him in eternity. By the will of God and Timothy, our brother. Paul was what he was only by the will of God. None of us are anything in the body other than by the will of God. If people put themselves into a position in their own strength or by the appointment of man, you're going to have a problem. Now, understand here, he's grooming Timothy. Moses groomed Joshua. I've known churches that become family enterprises where the father automatically grooms the son. It becomes the family business almost, a family enterprise, that it's assumed that there's going to be a pastoral dynasty. That is a wrong assumption. That is a very wrong assumption. There are ministries that have been destroyed by nepotism. Now that's not to say that a son can't succeed a father, but you better make sure it's the will of God. Too often it's been made a standard. Remember in the scriptures, we have a lot of examples of good men with bad sons. Samson, uh, Samuel got his job because the sons of Eli the priest were not good. But then Samson's own son turned out to be not too good. David had an Absalom, the sons of Aaron. Many of the great men of the Bible had wayward sons. In their adult life, they became wayward. Never assume that dynasty is God's way of appointing succession of leadership. Dynasty is not God's way. That's not to say God cannot will a son to succeed his father, but look at Kings and Chronicles. Good kings had bad sons. Some very good kings had some very bad sons. Just look at what happened with Josiah and Hezekiah, but the sons were completely no good. Dynastic leadership, it is absolutely a danger. Now, if it's a good son, that's okay. But too often in scripture, it was a bad son. Remember, the history of Israel was written in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 for our instruction that we wouldn't make the same mistake as Israel and the Jews. Be very careful when you see a father-son succession. That's not to say it's automatically wrong. It's not to say it's not of God, but a red flag should go up. You've really got to make sure that's God's will. 
I'm not making any secrets now. One of the most dangerous men in the body of Christ today, one of the main deceivers who Satan is using, is the son of a credible Bible expositor. One of the best teachings on the subject of prayer I ever heard in the 1970s, as a young believer, I heard it. One of the best expositions on the subject of prayer was given by Charles Stanley. Good expositor. Ran into personal marital problems for which he should have stepped out of the ministry. His son turned against him, and then when his son patched things up with him, it got worse. He was on TBN with the Crouches all during the scandals. This was the father now. The father compromised. Then the father compromised with his son. Instead of telling his sons, there's something wrong with you, he did not correct his sons. And he had his son speaking at his events. Now his son is a complete and utter heretic. His son is a Marcionite. His son draws a discontinuum. He uncouples the Old Testament from the New. This is an ancient heresy called Marcionism. The son is called Andy, Andy Stanley, a very dangerous false teacher. But he wouldn't be in that position if his father, who knew better and who knows better, had not engaged in nepotism. It must be by the will of God. Paul was called by the Lord. The Lord showed Paul, Timothy, Titus, be careful. Now, again, I'm not knocking people who are sons of good preachers and who take their father's place automatically. I'm simply saying there's a danger. Nepotism does get into the church, and it usually ends badly. Let's continue. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. It's his standard opening salutation, greeting. He puts the salutations first in a way. Uh, <clears throat> when you read it in the Hebrew New Testament, of course, the New Testament was not written in Hebrew, but he the Hebrew New Testament gives us some idea of the underlying Aramaic thought, as does the Syriac text. But it's Hesed Lechem Shalom Mi'et Elohim Avinu Ve'adon Yeshua HaMashiach. Now that was signatory. Paul puts this in the beginning of his epistles for a reason. It was his moniker. It was his avatar. It was his calling card. It was the way people knew it was from him. Many people were circulating false teachings, ascribing apostolic authority to themselves. This got worse in the second and third century during the time of the church fathers. Some of the church fathers, such as Irenaeus, withstood them. But right from the beginning, there was a problem with counterfeit apostles, false apostolic authority. Jesus talks about this to the first church, Ephesus, in Revelation chapter 2. Those who say they are apostles, but are not. Now, apostolic ministry is a whole subject in itself, and there's a distinction between the apostles who saw Jesus and who were inspired to write the scriptures and what we would call, in Greek at least, apostles today, meaning church planting missionaries, a big distinction. Apostles in the caliber and the unique calling of New Testament authors no longer exists and will not exist. However, apostolic authority in the church still exists. How does apostolic authority exist in the church today? Through the writing of the apostles. The teaching of the apostles is apostolic authority. Jesus gave it to them. They passed it on to us through the writing of the word. Jesus told the apostles, the Holy Spirit will remind you of all I have taught you. Teach them all I have taught you. The apostolic authority of the original 12 apostles and Paul still exists in what they wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit. That is it. If anybody else ever comes along claiming some kind of apostolic 
authority on a par with the teaching of the New Testament, they're a false apostle. Now, if they were around in the first century, you can imagine what it was like afterwards. But let's continue looking. We give thanks to you all. To God, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Remember, Christ Jesus is him on earth, Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, Jesus Christ is him on earth. Christ Jesus is him in eternity. And the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up in heaven, of which you had previously heard in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even it has, it has been doing, and also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who was a faithful servant of Christ in our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the spirit. Now, understand the word there that we translate hope. I read this in Greek today, and that word that we translate as the hope that's laid up, remember in scripture, hope is future fact. Hope is future fact. Fact, this word in the Greek text means expectation. It's something we should expect. Well, what should we expect? We're told what we should expect. The hope laid up in heaven of which you had previously heard the word of truth, the gospel. Notice the word of truth, the Word of truth is the logos of the evangelion, evangelion, the good news, the truth, the truth of the gospel. That is the basic truth. God becomes a man to take our sin, to atone for it, to die our death and give us his righteousness and his life, the just for the unjust. That's the good news and that's the truth. Any other gospel is a false gospel. Any other gospel is to be rejected. What's he talking about the gospel of truth? Well, to understand the gospel of truth, we have to understand the false ones. There are socially redeeming gospels, gospels based on good works, who some people imagine are a way of salvation. There have always been people who did good works for the poor. Vincenti di Paola in Italy, Vincent de Paul, saw the corruption of, of, of the Roman church in a very dark time in history, and he reached out to the poor. I don't judge him. I don't judge his motives. I think his motives were right. He may have had a relationship with the Lord, but he was in a dark time, a dark age. He's not a source of doctrine. The Catholic mystics, the same. Another one would be uh, Francis of Assisi. Well, they were humble people and they seemed to have good intentions, but their doctrine was completely wrong. They certainly did not believe the right gospel. Francis of Assisi used to put ashes in his food and things like this. Be careful of false gospels. We know that cults, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses have a false gospel. The Roman church has a false gospel that is called sacramentalism, sacramentalism. In Latin, it is an ex opere operato ritual. In other words, there's a power in the ritual or the ceremony itself to communicate or impute grace. It is a false gospel. There is this concept that rituals save, that sacraments save, that works save or belief in something false saves. There's only one true gospel. It doesn't matter how sincere or how nice or how good someone seems to be. If they have a false gospel, they are not true. I remember, and I've told this story several times or related this account, it's not a story, several times. When Mother Teresa of Calcutta was awarded the Nobel Prize uh, in India, um, I watched the documentary of her on, on 
PBS in the United States, and she made it clear that she did not attempt to create Hindus who worship other gods or demons or Muslims to Christianity or to faith in Christ. She wanted to make them better Hindus and better Muslims. She wanted to do not, you know, do not pass, go to hell, go directly to hell. Do not pass, go, do not collect $200. She had a false gospel. It doesn't matter the works. If what somebody believes is false, the rest doesn't count. They have no credibility. If somebody has a false gospel, the rest doesn't count. Now, there may be evangelical Christians who we disagree with on a number of issues. Pre-tribulationists, even moderate Calvinists, they're, they're ones we may disagree with. But if they believe the true gospel, if they've been born of the Spirit based on the true gospel, they are still our brethren. They may be mistaken. They may think we're mistaken. But they have the truth in terms of salvation. Now let's continue looking at this. What he says is, after you have this truth, the next thing that happens is the fruit, the fruit. What is the fruit? The fruit is increasing even as has been doing. There are multiple kinds of fruit in the New Testament associated with salvation and associated with Christian life. There's something called the fruit of repentance that John the Baptist spoke of. Unless there's a fruit of repentance, it's inedible. Unless there is a fruit of repentance. That is the first fruit associated with the gospel in the New Testament. It was introduced by John the Baptist, but the apostles preached it, repent and believe. Be very careful of these seeker-sensitive churches and these seeker-friendly messages that do not talk about the realities of judgment, conviction of sin, and the need for repentance. That is not a gospel of truth. The fruit is no good. Where there's a true gospel, the first fruit you will see is that of repentance, an admission that we are alienated from God because of our sin, and we need to repent. That is the beginning of it. No repentance, no real salvation. Think of going down a supermarket with a, with a carriage and you're going down the, the vegetable aisle and you've got cucumbers and you've got tomatoes and you've got oranges and you've got coconuts and you've got to take this fruit and this fruit and this fruit and this fruit. Well, the first fruit on the shelf is the fruit of repentance. Unless you get that in the carriage, don't go any further. It is a formula for false conversions. That's the first fruit, okay? The second fruit is the fruit of souls. A fruit of the true gospel will be souls. People will actually be saved. They will be regenerated. They will be born again. But what happens if you're a fruit and you bear fruit? Well, it has seeds or seedlings, doesn't it? With germ cells in it. We are born biologically to reproduce. We are born again to reproduce. Not every Christian is an evangelist, but every Christian is a witness. We cannot all fish with nets. Some can, some can't, but we can all fish with a rod, a pole. There's none of us who can't share our faith one-on-one, -on -one, give our testimony, knock on a door, invite somebody to an evangelistic meeting, hand somebody a track. No, we can't all stand up on a platform and preach to a large group of people. Not everybody has the gift of evangelists. We don't all fish with a net, but we all fish with a pole. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord. Those who turn many to righteousness will shine brightly, we're told in Daniel 12. Every one of us, every one of us is a witness, and witnesses witness. The Greek word is martyria, we bear witness. We bear witness to something we are willing to die for, and that Christ did die for. In Greek, martyrio, we bear witness to something that we are willing to die for in the knowledge that Christ did die for it, but in the certainty that the power of death is reversed because of it, because of it. Okay. 
So that's the second kind of fruit. The second kind of fruit. Think of young believers when they first get saved. They don't know anything. They don't have any experience. They don't know the scriptures well. And perhaps they have a misguided enthusiasm as we all did, or most of us did. We think we can be Peter, James, and John from the first week until you run into trials and hit the first wall and you find out you're not, you're not what you thought you were. But what do they have? They have in Ephesus what's called their first love. The Ephesians were told you've lost your first love. One of the battles of faithful Christians, of faithful Christians now, and the Ephesians were faithful. They were a good church. A battle that every faithful Christian, a doctrinally right Christian, and there's much to be said about Ephesians. Remember, Ephesians, as we said last week, is the partner, the bedfellow epistle of Colossians. They detested the false apostles. They hated false doctrine. They had paid, they had endurance and all that, but they lost their first love. Well, one of the things that will express somebody's first love, obviously their prayer life, their hunger for the word, but also a drive to tell other people. Once you're blind and then you see, you want to tell other people they can see. Once you are lost and you get found, you immediately want to tell other people they can get found. Now, you might go about it in the wrong way and not have experience or not have a lot of biblical knowledge, but you know you've been born again. You know you've been regenerated. You know you've been born of the Spirit. Okay? That's the first love. That's the first love. One barometer of our first love will be our drive to share our faith with the unsaved. One of the gauges of how much we love the Lord is our desire to tell other people about him. Now remember, we evangelize for three reasons. We don't primarily do it for them. When we witness to an unsaved person, we do it for them, but that's secondary. Our primary reason to want to see the fruit of souls is for the Lord. He died for them. He's entitled to them. He's entitled to be glorified and worshiped by them. Our first motive for evangelism is to glorify the Lord. Our second is to see these people who he loves escape the judgment of Gehenna. As much as we love our unsaved loved ones, as much as we desire to see our family members saved and come to faith, as much as we desire to see them saved, remember, the Lord wants to see them saved more than we do. As much as we love them and dread the thought of them being eternally lost, the Lord dreads it even more. He dreads it even more. He loves them more than we do. He already proved it on the cross. So we evangelize, we bear the fruit of souls first for the Lord. The fruit is presented to the Lord. Thirdly, and only thirdly, we do it for ourselves. Now, Daniel 12 makes it clear there's a reward for doing it, but we come third. First is God. Second is for the unsaved. Third for us. There is a reward in it. Daniel makes it, and other passages, there, those who turn many to righteousness will shine brightly. I'm not saying there's not a reward in evangelism. There will be a reward for evangelism. Absolutely. But that's not the main reason we do it. It's not notches on our gun. It's to the glory of God. And it's not primarily our love for the unsaved. It's the love of Christ for the unsaved. Our love for them is secondary. Tertiary, thirdly, then, then, then it's us. So the fruit of repentance, then the fruit of souls follows the gospel. But let's see what comes next. What other kind of fruit? He begins talking. And he says, 
constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it's been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Notice it must be the truth. As you learn from Epaphras, our beloved brother, fellow bond servant, who is faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the spirit. Now, I would just briefly point out bond servant. Bond servant. There were two kinds of servantship in biblical times. And in fact, this existed even in colonial America initially. There was slavery. Slavery. God did not like slavery. Didn't like it. The people were the Lord's, the Lamb was the Lord's. The Hebrews were not allowed to practice enslaving another believer. And if a pagan came to faith in the Jewish God and underwent ritual conversion, they'd be considered the same as any Jew. God did not like slavery. Paul accepted the fact that it was prolific in the Roman Empire, but he didn't like it. He said, if you can get free, get free. He also knew that there were Christians who were wealthy who owned slaves, and those slaves would be socioeconomically displaced if they were just given their freedom. So Paul says, treat them like brothers, treat them like family. Okay. But there was two kinds. There was a kind of slavery God was against. <laughs> was against. The other kind, though, is the kind of slavery he allowed. We call it in English indenturism. Indenturism. If a Hebrew wanted to, or if a Hebrew became financially indebted or in some debt to someone, he could become a bond servant. A bond servant. But he would be set free at the year of Jubilee. Hashanah HaYovel. It was like a temporary employment contract. A temporary employment contract. If the sun sets you free, you shall be free indeed. No slavery in Christ. He who commits sin is slave to sin. He came to set us free. But there is a kind of indenturism. Bond servants. We legally bond to him of our own volition. We choose. We choose. Now there will be a year of Jubilee where we shall be as he is. That does not mean we're going to be God, but it does mean we're going to be exalted. <laughs> he will. We glorify him now. He will one day glorify us. This is foreshadowed by the teaching of the year of Jubilee we have a recorded teaching about the year of Jubilee. We are not servants or slaves. We are bond servants. Now, there was an option usually performed at, at Passover. If the year of Jubilee came, but a particular bond servant liked who he worked for, liked who he worked for, or wanted to stay, this guy has got wealth, he takes good care of me, he treats me like a family. He could voluntarily remain bonded. And they would drive a gold ring to his ear into a doorpost. That was the ritual. That, that's how they signed the contract. But it was completely voluntary. Well, Jesus treats us good. We volunteer to enter into that permanent contract with him because he saved us and because he will, will reward us. There was a book written in the United States against slavery by abolitionists. And it was written by a woman who was a saved Christian called Harriet Beecher Stowe. The book was Uncle Tom's Cabin. Fantastic book. Unfortunately, the book is, is misapplied by people who never read it. Uncle Tom was a black slave who was adopted into the family of Little Eva. 
there was a, a soul singer in the 1960s, a black American soul singer, sang the locomotion. She took her name from that book. Everybody's doing a brand new dance. Come on, baby, do the locomotion. She named herself after the character of this book, which was also easily converted into a stage play. And it stirred up abolitionism in the 1850s in the United States, uh, in the Northern States. And Uncle Tom was not mistreated. He was adopted into the family and wanted to stay in the family. Unfortunately, a villain comes along and his name is Simone Legree. And after the death of little Eva's father, Simone Legree wants to enslave blacks as opposed to little Ava's family who wanted to free blacks, they went to abolitionism. And these people in the book, you see there's a strong Christian influence and emphasis in everything they did. But Simone Legree comes along and he flogs Uncle Tom to death. He flogs Uncle Tom to death because Uncle Tom would not disclose the hiding place of runaway black slaves. <laughs> were trying to get across the Mason-Dixon line into the north or across the Ohio River, wherever it was, into the northern states. Uncle Tom was in no way a black collaborator with corrupt white establishment. That is a myth and a lie invented by Marcus Garvey in New York, the founder of the Rastafarian movement. There was a black like that in the book who was a collaborator against his own people. Uh, with, with the Simone Legree type plantation owners, his name was Sanbo. Sanbo was the real Uncle Tom. Uncle Tom was not an Uncle Tom. Anyway, I only mention this to explain how, how it is. We are adopted into a family. He, he was treated like little Ava's uncle. They, they were nice to him. He had no desire. He had a much better life with them, living in the house and everything, than he would have had under any other conditions. Uh, at that time in the American South. Uh, well, that's like we are. S Simone Legree is the devil. <laughs> he, he wants slaves. He who commits sin is slave to sin. Okay. <laughs> uh, we volunteer to enter into a contractual relationship that we volunteer to make permanent. It is to our advantage but it is first of all to the glory of God. Jesus bought us. He's entitled to us. He gave everything to get us. He gave everything to get us while we were yet sinners. He is justly entitled to us. But he wants to adopt us. <laughs> he wants us to be his children. Jesus told his disciples, you are my friends. Yes, of course, it is to our blessing and to our advantage. But he is legally entitled to us. Yet he does not force it on us. He chose us, and he wants us to choose him. We are not slaves. We are bond servants. That term bond servant is an important term in Scripture. The unsaved are slaves. They're slaves to sin. We are bond servants. We are free people, free in Christ, who choose to follow him. He died for us. We know we can trust him. We're bond servants. And let's look. So we have the next kind of fruit. He informed us of your love in the Spirit. When you read the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, it's difficult to translate from Greek. We say, charity, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, benignity, long-suffering, fear of the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit is love. All of these other things are attributes of it. They all come from the love. Peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, long-suffering, mildness, fear of the Lord, they come from the love, but the fruit itself is love. So when you have the true gospel preached, automatically there will be three kinds of fruit. There will be fruit of repentance, 
there'll be the fruit of souls, obviously, that comes as a result of, of planting the seed of the gospel. And then there will be the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit is the divine nature manifested in Christ. When we bear the fruit of the spirit, we become Christ-like. Three kinds of fruit. But they all depend on a true gospel. Without a true gospel, you will not have those three kinds of fruit. You can't get rid of your sin the way Adam and Eve tried to. You can't get rid of your sin by the law. The law simply taught about our need for a savior, a messiah. You can't get rid of your sin by going to tell a pedophile Roman Catholic priest that you did something terrible when he probably did something more terrible than you did. You can't get rid of your sin by these means. Only the true gospel, the real good news, can do this. But the fruit. Jesus hung on a tree. Cursed is everyone who hung on a tree. Well, there's the fruit of repentance. There's the fruit of souls. And there's the fruit of the spirit. Whereas the true gospel, you will see three kinds of fruit. Three different baskets of fruit. You're going up the aisle in the supermarket, and there's three kinds of fruit in that order. The fruit of repentance, right? fruit of souls, and then you'll see the fruit of the spirit. The more somebody, the longer they become like a Christian, the more Christ-like they should become. That is the order of bearing fruit. Now let's continue looking at this. Verse 9, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we've not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and knowledge. Since the day we heard of it, again, he may have come here later on his third missionary journey, we don't know, but he's not been here yet. Okay. We've not ceased to pray when we heard about what God is doing in this and ask you and that you may be filled with knowledge of his will in all wisdom and understanding. First comes the fruit. What comes next if somebody is really following Jesus? Knowing God's will for your life. His wisdom, not the wisdom of the world. Third, understanding his word. Understanding his word. Those three things will come. Now, Jesus didn't say, you'll know them by their doctrine. He said, you know them by their fruit. But if the fruit is there, you're going to want right doctrine. <laughs> if the fruit is there, you're going to want right doctrine. The same as you can't have real salvation without a true gospel. You cannot have real discipleship without true doctrine. It is impossible. You will not have God's wisdom, and neither will it be possible to truly understand God's will for your life. It's gotten to the point in the church where things have become ridiculous. Ridiculous. I know people who profess to be Christians, and you know people, probably, in the same situation. They had no biblical grounds for divorce. An unbelieving partner didn't leave them and go off with somebody else and leave them, uh, you know, the, the, no biblical grounds. Oh, we were young and we were foolish when we got married and then we got saved and we just found we were incompatible. So we, we got divorced and remarried and we think the Lord's okay with that. No, he's not okay with that. No, he is not okay with that. Even if you get saved after you're married and your husband or wife is not saved, after your own relationship with the Lord, your family is your next priority. The salvation of your spouse is the next most important thing in your life. Now, if they leave you and go off with somebody, 1 Corinthians 7, we can look at that. But this casual stuff, you know, 
Christians getting divorced and remarried, and then they come to the Lord's table and eat and drink judgment to themselves on top of it. The early Christians never would have done this. A generation ago, it would have been unthinkable. Even in, in the church today, it would have been unthinkable a generation ago. When you heard of Christians' divorce, it was either something before they were saved, or they had an unbelieving partner who left them or something like that and went off with somebody. The idea of two saved Christians getting divorced and remarried was unthinkable. Unthinkable. There must be, the unbeliever has to leave, or there must be unrepentant pornea, sexual immorality. Otherwise, the, the discussion is not even on the table. The last resort for Christians is, of course, in a bad marriage, is a, a troubled marriage is 1 Corinthians 7. Separation with the door left open to the possibility and hope of reconciliation. God hates divorce. Well, if you love the Lord, you'll love what he loves and you'll hate what he hates, and he hates divorce. He hates it. Now, we have other tapes explaining why. But oh, I believe I'm in God's will, even though I'm... We have preachers, we have pastors of churches that are unscripturally married and remarried after getting divorced from another Christian. How can this be? How can it be? And they think they're in God's will? Sometimes it gets ridiculous. Uh, I, read, I would never do a conference with him. He's older now. Hal Lindsey was on his fifth marriage. Five, five. The guy who wrote Lake Bray Planet Earth, five. I'm not, not gossiping. This is public known. How, how does that work? Well, it doesn't work. Yet there's people who are plainly out of God's will in areas of morality, particularly the marital issue now. Now it's gone into homosexuality and abnormal sexual orientation. The church has to be gay friendly and all this kind of stuff. And this is what they're doing. Flatly out of God's will. Flatly out of God's will. Unambiguously out of God's will. But people are going for it. The British pop star, retired, I guess, Cliff Richard says the church has to change its position on gay marriage. <laughs> Just Steve Chalk in England, the, the, Britain's biggest youth minister, teaches this as well. I, they don't know God's will. God's will is, first of all, that we lead moral lives. If you're not married, don't sleep with her. If you're not married to him, don't sleep with him. End the story. That's all there is to it. No exceptions. There aren't any exceptions. They think they're in God's will? They're not in God's will. Sexuality is, of course, not the only area. I knew a Christian who was in the gambling profession in Australia. I said, Wait a minute, thou shalt not covet. He believed he could be in God's will as long as he paid a tithe or whatever. <laughs> there was a U.S. senator who was on the Senate committee that controlled federal taxpayer dollar subsidies to the tobacco industry. At the same time, the federal government was spending a fortune on warning against cigarette smoking. They were spending a co-equal fortune, just about, on subsidizing tobacco farming. And you had the senator who said he was born again, Jesse Helms, and he was on that senatorial committee. His wife's family were one of the biggest tobacco farmers in Carolina. But how can you make this kind of money in an industry that's killing people? How can you do this? And, and, and then you're on the, you're a politician and a Christian supposed to be salt and light in the Senate and you're on that committee doing these things. I'm not got these, these things are publicly known, you understand. 
I'm not gossiping. I'm just stating these things. There are many Christians out of God's will in a fundamental way. They are doing things fundamentally, blatantly, not in harmony with what the Scripture teaches, that are incongruous with the teaching of Scripture. Not things that are arguable, things that are blatant, and they're doing it. If you don't know the Scripture, you won't know God's will. Now, this relates to another subject. We have a teaching called the cafeteria, pick and choose. We won't teach on that subject. We won't look at what the Bible says about that subject. It might offend people. Well, let's look. If you do not have understanding of the Scripture, you will not know God's will for your life. And if you do not have wisdom, His wisdom, as opposed to the wisdom of the world, as we looked at last week, you will not have this understanding. It goes on. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects. Once again, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Then we get to the fourth kind of fruit. The fourth kind of fruit. That fourth kind of fruit, look at what it says. In every good work increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. Uh, thumia, thumia. Joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He's made us qualified for the glory ahead. But he's looking for the fruit. First fruit, repentance, okay. Second fruit, let me see what it is. The fruit of souls. So we grow fruit of the spirit. But then it talks about the need for wisdom and knowledge to bear the fourth kind of fruit. The fruit of good works. You cannot bear the fruit of good works. We all want Jesus to say something to us when we meet him. In my case, I'm afraid sometimes he's going to say, oh, it's you. All right, get in here. Mansions in heaven. I think I'm going to get a bungalow on the outskirts sometimes. You see the preacher. God sees the real James Jacob Prash. They're not always the same, believe me. But you know what? That's not only my problem. It's probably true of you too. So here we are. He qualifies us. I'm not qualified for this. No, he has to qualify us. However, while it is possible by God's grace to bear the fruit of repentance, bear the fruit of souls, and to bear the fruit of the Spirit, you cannot bear the fruit of good works of a life well lived. Remember, in the seven churches in Revelation, beginning with Ephesus, Jesus judged every church on what they did, on their works, on what they did. And we're not talking about a judgment unto salvation. We're talking to a judgment unto reward. Our sin was judged on the cross. Faithful believers do not appear before the seat of, of, of the judicial throne, which is the uh, thronos. Faithful believers appear before the bima. The bima is where the kings of the poluses, the city-states of ancient Greece, gave out their rewards to the athletes who competed successfully in the Olympics. It was like wreaths and things that they put on like a crown. That is it. So we compete for the crown. Our sin was judged on the cross, but there will be a judgment. We meet the Lord. What did you do with your life? Well, I repented and believed. Yeah, I know that, or you wouldn't be here. But what did you do with your life? 
Where's the works? Where are they? Now remember the parable in Luke and in Matthew 25. The parable of the talents. What did you do with what God gave you? Now this is a related subject. I only pointed out in relation to this passage. But we will give account for what we do with what we are given to do. He expects a return on his investment. He's invested a lot in us. He's invested a lot in you, and he's invested a lot in me. And he reasonably expects a return on our investment. Now remember, those who give him no return on their investment are backsliders, are backsliders. They covered up their backslidden state with religion. Just think of Laodicea. They were blind to their true state. Think of the epistle of Jude. They cover up their backslidden state with religiosity. They're not giving the Lord a return on his investment. They play the religious game about it. Look with me to the book of Amos, please. Chapter 4. Verse 4, enter Bethel and transgress. Bethel means house of God. In Gilgal, multiply transgressions. They're not living right. Bring your sacrifices every three days and your tithes every three days and your sacrifice every morning. Offer a thank offering also from that which is leavened. They were very bad at being faithful to the Lord but they were very good at covering it up with religion. Oh, I pay my tithe, I'm covered. They think it's like paying an insurance premium. If I have an accident, it's all right, I'm covered. It's like paying a supplemental medical insurance. Oh, if I get sick, I'm covered. I paid my tithe, I'm all right. And churches propagate this mentality. They tell people as long as they're coming to church and paying the tithe and going through the Sunday routine that they're all right. This is a false sense of security. This is religion. It's not Christianity. The Lord wants a return in his investment. I know what you did, but my son died to pay for what you did. All right, we can get you off. But now... Once he got you off, what did you do? We will be judged on the basis of our works. Not our sin, but our works. Now notice, the fruit of repentance, the fruit of the spirit, the fruit of souls all come together. But the fruit of works requires wisdom and understanding to know God's will for your life. Under, if you don't have right doctrine, you're not even you're not going to know God's will for your life, but you're not going to be equipped to do it even if you did. The Lord wants us to grow in our understanding of right doctrine. So we go down the vegetable aisle again, the fruits and vegetables, the fruit, fruit aisle in the supermarket. Okay, we got the coconuts, we got the pineapples, Okay, and, you know, and we got the bananas. Where's the cherries? That's next. No, 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 no. They're further down the aisle. You got to do something to get there. If you're like me and you are like me, there are certain aspects of your life, certain respects that your life is pleasing to the Lord. In certain respects, my life, and in certain respects, your life is pleasing to the Lord. But in other respects, our lives are not. The thing about Jesus was, in all respects, his life was pleasing to the Father. In all respects. In all respects. He wants us, in all respects, to bear fruit in every good work. 
strengthened with this power, according to his glorious might. We cannot do it in our own strength. He must equip us, again, the way it's put, he must qualify us. We cannot do it in our own strength, but we have to make the choice. You know, it's like anything else. That's like overcoming sin. I was strung out on drugs as a kid, and my own strength, I, I couldn't have quit. And my own strength, I could not have done it. He empowered me to do it, but I had to do it. Then it continues. Now it goes from talking about what happens at salvation. He's telling these Christians what happens at salvation and then discipleship, the longer term plan and purpose of God for their lives and God's expectation. Now he balances God's expectation of them in juxtaposition right next to their expectation from God. You can expect the glory of heaven. You can expect this blessing. You can expect this future. You can expect it. We can expect it. We can ex reasonably, we can expect it from the Lord. He said so. We can expect it from him. What is a two-way street? He expects from us. Coming down to verse 13. Now it begins to become more theological in the sense of knowledge of God himself and more Christological, dealing with God in Christ. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He transferred us. In other words, he gave us a passport and a new citizenship, even though we are not in the country that is now our own yet. But we have a right to go there. The ship is coming to take us home. We have a new citizenship. I'm very sorry about what's happening in Great Britain. The country's being destroyed. My grandparents were from here and so forth. I'm very sorry about it. I'm very sorry about the destruction of America, apparently. Uh, what's happened? I'm very sorry about it. But thank God I've got a new passport. Thank God I've got a better citizenship. As much as I love Britain and America and Israel, I have a better citizenship. When I see these terrible things happening in Israel and in, in, in the United States and in England, countries I love, it bothers me. Why shouldn't it? Jeremiah grieved over what happened to his country. The Hebrew prophets grieved over it. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. That's natural. That's normal. That's love. We grieve over it. But thank God we have a passport. We have a ticket out. And in the millennium, we have a ticket back. There is a future in Christ. So it goes on. He says, in him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now this word for redemption is interesting. Uh, in Greek, it is not the word, it is not the Greek translation of the Hebrew goel, which means to buy back. This, this term goes beyond that. Uh, He takes away our, the consequences of what we did. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That verse 15 highlighted. He is the image of the invisible God. What does David Lister look like? All David Lister has to do is look in the mirror and he'll see what he looks like. What does Marco Quintana look like? What does Petty Ayatova look like? All they have to do is look in the mirror. That's what they look like. God is no mystery. 
What is God like? He's a person. There's three persons. One God. What is he like? What's God the Father like? Jesus. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Jesus is God made man. He's the image of the Father, just like you or I looking in a mirror. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. That is the character and nature of God. Let's look at him. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and the earth, visible and invisible, whether on earth, <clears throat> visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place, or it could be translated preeminence. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. The entire fullness of the nature and character of the deity dwells in Jesus. Now, on earth, we saw his character. Remember in the book of Revelation, the Apostle John. The Apostle John knew Jesus humanly, physically, literally. He knew Jesus in human form. But when that same John saw Jesus on Patmos in the vision, when he saw Jesus, not as Jesus Christ, but as Christ Jesus, when he saw him in his glorified divine state in Revelation 1, he fell as if slain. He knew Jesus as a man, but when he saw him as God, he fell as if he was dead. Jesus had to say, no, it's me. That's quite a thing, isn't it? What is God like? Look at Jesus. But then it tells us something else. It affirms John chapter 1. The world was made through him. It affirms Proverbs chapter 8. God created everything through his son, Jesus. Not only through him, but for him. Not only through him, but for him. You think of a father who has one son, one beloved son, and he builds a house, and he acquires some land and a business and a family fortune, and he says, I'm doing this all for my son. He loves the son that much. Everything that God does, he does for Jesus. Everything that God does, he does for and through Jesus. Creating the universe. The creation of angelic beings. Even Satan was created through Jesus. Of course, he wasn't called Jesus in eternity. He's called the Son. And of course, Satan wasn't fallen yet. But he was a created being. There is nothing God has ever done, ever made, that was not done through Christ. And nothing that was not done for Christ. We can't understand God in our human condition, but we can understand Jesus up to a point. Now, this is important because there are liberal theologians going back to the early Enlightenment in the 18th century who argued and who still argue that Paul invented Christianity, the original apostolic Christianity of Peter was a different one. And Peter and Paul didn't like each other. And it was Paul who began Christianity. There are many Jewish rabbis today who teach this. 
I'm high Maccabi being one, the late David Flusser being another academic rabbis, saying that Paul began Christianity, not Jesus. Jesus was just a rabbi and things like this. Well, as you see, Paul's doctrine of the creation affirms John's doctrine of the creation in John chapter one. The world was made through him. The world was made by him. In other words, Colossians 1, verses 15 to 17, uh, are a reference to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. He continues, he's before all things, and in him all things hold together, but he has this preeminence. Even when we shall be as he is, he will be preeminent. He will always be preeminent. Although he brings many sons to the Father, Jesus will always have the place of pride in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Now that's incredible. We know why things on earth could be reconciled to God, why fallen man or fallen men and women could be reconciled to God because of what happened on earth. But the fall affected heaven. The fall affected heaven. The books of Daniel, Zechariah, Job, and Revelation deal with this. Again, I only mention it in passing. One of the reasons there'll be a new heaven and a new earth is this. Job and, and Revelation tell us, and, and, and Zechariah tell us, Satan has access to the present one. He will not have access to the new one. This whole thing has to be reconciled through the blood of Jesus. Having been made through the blood of the cross, that's why Revelation itself talks about the lamb that was slain in heaven. The lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Incredible. We see it from a temporal, historical, earthly perspective. Revelation tells us the same truth from an eternal perspective. The lamb was slain before the foundation, outside of time. It's an eternal act. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, present if indeed you continue in the faith firmly, established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Now look at this. We were enemies of God because of our sin. Yet while we were enemies, as it were, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us because of God's love. Okay. <clears throat> so we're reconciled. And it's there. And we're considered to be God's children and so forth. <clears throat> but he's calling us to be holy and blameless. We are reconciled. God and myself have been reconciled. I was alienated from God. I was this, I was a that, I was a fornicator. <clears throat> I was God's enemy, but we've been reconciled through Christ because of his blood. <clears throat> he took the blame for what I did, paid the price. I'm reconciled. <clears throat> but what does it say about that state of reconciliation that comes through the gospel? The hope of the gospel. Now remember that hope of the gospel in verse 23 means a future fact. The gospel's promise is a future fact. Reconciled to God. But what's the condition? 
it says, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, <coughs> and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. Notice what it says. There's an expectation of it. It's a future fact. If, if we do not move away from it and make ourselves God's enemy again. If we continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, let no one convince you otherwise. Unrepentant backsliders, unrepentant backsliders have no assurance of salvation unless they repent. And there is a point of no return. Unrepentant backsliders have no assurance of salvation. Those who walk with Christ have the assurance of salvation. We can be sure of our salvation right this instant. But unrepentant backsliders need to repent. They've made themselves God's enemies again. Now, this relates to Hebrews 6 and 10, and I'm not going there now. Perhaps we'll look at Hebrews 6 and 10 and some other teaching. But understand what it says. All of this hope, this expectation, this idea of we've been redeemed and reconciled, it's there. The glory, the promise, the blessing is a future fact. It's something we can expect. It's something we should expect. But verse 23 if indeed we continue in the faith. You've got these people, I prayed to receive the Lord Jesus, hallelujah, when I was 16 years old. I was baptized in the First Baptist Church, Macon, Georgia. And they think because they said the sinner's prayer and got baptized, that's it. That's it. Yes, sir. When I was sin to Luke, Saturday night, made love in the back of my 58 Chevy. Went to church Sunday morning. <laughs> they might have religion, but they don't have redemption. They had redemption, perhaps. Perhaps they had it, but they haven't continued. Paul was made a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Remember, he wrote this from jail. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body. Remember, he says, Christ is the head of the body, which is the church in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from our past ages and generations, but now has been manifested to the saints. Now understand this. This is all predicated on the headship of Christ the headship of Christ. In Great Britain, the title head of the Church of England is the British monarch. That's nonsense. In the Roman Church, the papacy, it's nonsense. Christ is the head of the church, and he is the head alone. When someone is in place of Christ, that is antichrist. But let's look. He says this, and Paul is only a minister of it. We are only ministers of it. But he says, according to the stewardship in Christ's afflictions, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit. When God calls somebody to the ministry, whether it's a missionary, a pastor, an evangelist, whether they're full-time or part-time or bivocational, when God calls somebody to ministry, and every Christian is a minister, when God calls us to it, 
it always involves a willingness to suffer for it. It always involves a willingness to suffer for it. This fallen world is Satan's kingdom, and he doesn't like us. He doesn't like us because he doesn't like Jesus. But then it continues further. Why? For your benefit. If I am expounding God's word tonight, for my benefit, I have no right to do it. If I am doing this for my benefit, I shouldn't be doing it. I do it to glorify God for your benefit. If I'm not doing it for your benefit, I shouldn't be doing it at all. What we do, we do to the glory of God for the benefit of others. We may benefit from it, but that's never the primary motivation. Never. On the contrary, we shouldn't be doing it to benefit from it. We should be willing to suffer for the sake of doing it. Now I can tell you this thing, but only God can teach it to you. Read Jeremiah, read Lamentations. Uh, the alienation, the loneliness, the isolation, he was being afflicted, rejected as a type of Christ. But he did it anyway. He was trying to benefit the nation to the glory of God, even though he saw the destruction coming. Yet Paul rejoiced in his sufferings, and he's in a Roman prison doing it. Not a very good place to be. I suppose because he was a Roman citizen, they let him write letters. But then it goes on. That is the mystery that's been hidden in the past ages and generations, but now has been manifested to his saints. In the book of Revelation in the trumpet judgments, the mystery of God is manifested to the world. They will know what we know now. They will know we were right. No matter what unsaved people say, no matter what they do, no matter what they think about us, one day they will know we were right. But it will be too late. But they'll know we were right. The mystery of God that has been manifested to us, they're going to see it. They're going to see it in the trumpet judgments. Now let's look at this. Mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Again, the hope of glory means the expectation of it. We proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom. He goes back to doctrine again and to wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. These things can never be done in our own strength. Never. But he's the head of the body. And he wants the body to be complete. Who wants a body with a foot missing or a finger missing or an eye missing? Nobody. Well, Christ does not want his body with members missing. He wants every member to be there and function. My pinky functions. My ears function. My eyes function. Everything functions except in my case, my brain, but everything functions. Okay. He wants everything to function. He wants the body to work right, even when it's persecuted, even when Paul was in prison, even under dire, dire circumstances, the body was still able to work right. That's an incredible thing. Now, a time will come when no man can work. That's a separate issue. But even under the most dire of circumstances, the body can work correctly if we do it 
and handle it in God's wisdom and in God's order. Admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom. What's Paul saying? Why is he writing these letters? He's teaching. He's teaching the doctrine that will tell them how to live, what to do, and how to do it. So, we have the introductory portion of this chapter. And remember, there's no chapter division in the original canon. We have the introductory portion. Its purpose is to show how Paul is training Timothy, much the same way as Moses trained Joshua. It is to establish his apostleship and the authenticity of what he was teaching from the false apostles. It was to let them know he knew who they were and what God was doing, and they're in his prayers and thinking about, he's thinking about them, despite the fact he's in prison. You think a guy in a Roman prison would have other things on his mind. And he goes on to say this is true of the neighboring churches and Laodicea and so forth. But then, after that, after these salutations and these opening identifications and a statement of his reason for writing, he begins talking about the fruit. The fruit. The true gospel will always yield fruit. Fruit of repentance. Right? It will yield the fruit of soul saved. It'll yield the fruit of the spirit. And it'll yield good works. These things together might be called the fruit of righteousness. The fruit of righteousness taken together. They may be called the fruit of righteousness. As opposed to the fruit of wickedness. That's in the world. Then he goes on in this chapter to address the issue of Christology. The person of Christ and his deity. And how, if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Just like looking in the mirror shows you what you are like, looking at Jesus will show you what the Father is like. Remember, show us the Father, and what does Jesus say? You see me all this time, you don't recognize me? <laughs> That's quite a thing. He's the perfect image of the Father. This is what the Father looks like. Then, these promises, these blessings, are things that are future facts. What we hope in is a future fact. It's something we should expect. But at the same time, there's something God expects. He expects us to continue in the faith and to bear the fruit. Food of repentance, food of spirit, food of souls, food of righteousness, and the fruit of good works. We will continue with chapter two next week. In many respects, chapter two is the heart of what Colossians means for Christians today and what we're facing in the days in which we live. Now, I'll leave you with one last thing. He says, now we know the mystery. In Revelation, when you read the trumpets, again, when it says the mystery of God is now the mystery of God is revealed, the unsaved are going to know it. They're going to know we were right. They're going to know it. Of course, our prayer and our aspiration is that many of them will come to know we're right now before it's too late. Because by the time they find out we're right, they're also going to find out that they were wrong. Praise God for our salvation, for the true gospel. Thank you for listening. My apologies to those who could not see this on live stream. We hope to get it adjusted for next week. Thank you so much, Jake. I really appreciate that. The one question was, uh, how, uh, the, the the term of 
apostles being misused today. Um, does scripture actually say that uh, apostles today are church planters? How do we tell the difference? Okay, Th that does relate to tonight's subject somewhat, so I can take that question. It, that's, a, that's a fair question in light of something we said. Uh, uh, that's, it's in the ballpark, it's a fair game, so I'll, I'll answer it. Um, there are multiple categories of apostles. The first is in Hebrews with the definite article, ho apostolo. Jesus is the apostle. Apostle means one who was sent out, apo in Greek, from the Hebrew shaliach, shaliach, the one who was sent. It's related to the term Shiloh, Shiloh. Jesus is called Shiloh in Genesis 49, uh, or he's referred to as Shiloh. Uh, and the pool of Siloam, the same thing, where Jesus did the baptism of the, the, the blind man. Okay, same thing. So he is the apostle, the apostle. Other people can be an apostle, but they cannot be the apostle. The apostle is Christ and Christ alone. He is the one who was sent. All apostolic authority must come from him. Paul says, I'm an apostle according to the will of God, not according to his own. All apostolic authority must come from Jesus. He's first. Then we have the case of the 12, the 12 original apostles. They were even distinguished from the 70, the 12, the 12. They correspond typologically to the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 princes of Israel, the sons of Jacob in Genesis 49, the 12 and 12. It is likely that the 24 elders in Revelation, the Old and New Testament, are the 12 sons of Jacob and the 12 apostles. Uh, no place is 24, a number that represents the church, uh, but seven is. But you have the 12 and the 12, okay? Jesus told the apostles, you will judge the tribes of Israel, remember? On the throne in Revelation, you'll judge the tribes of Israel. Yep. So, there's a unique case of the 12. Then there was the case of Paul. Paul was unique, sort of, in that, well, not sort of, he was unique, in that he was not one of the 12, but he had the same authority as the others. He was not one of them, but he had co-equal authority, okay? He saw the Lord. He was even raptured in 2 Corinthians and taken to heaven and things were revealed to him. He wrote about the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11 as if he were present. I received from the Lord that which I delivered unto you. He was not with the 12 at the Last Supper, but he wrote as if he were. Some people have made the mistake of saying the apostles should not have cast lots for Matthias to replace Judas. Some people have said that. That is a mistake. When we read Acts chapter 1, we see that one of the qualifications of the 12, one of the qualifications to be among the 12, they had to be around from the time of the baptism of John. John was the last figure of the Old Covenant. He was the last figure of the Old Covenant. The law and prophets are preached until John, but grace and truth from Jesus, okay? In other words, the apostles had to have been under the Old Covenant, John representing the, the perfection or the closest you can get to perfection under the law. None born among women is greater than John. Paul did not meet that criteria. Paul could not have been one of the 12. But he was given co-equal authority with the 12, and he did see the Lord, and he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write scripture. Okay, so it's the case of Paul. Now, look with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
Paul attacks party spirit, and he says this in verse 12. This I mean that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. Three categories of apostles are represented by those three people. Cephas is Kaipha, Rock, Peter, it's Peter. One of the twelve. The unique case of Paul and then Apollos. Apollos was a Bible expositor, an evangelist, and a church planter. But he was not one of the 12, and he was not like Paul. The only kind of apostle we have today are the Apollos kind. They get saved like everyone else. They didn't see Jesus. They didn't know Jesus. They did not author scripture. They're not inspired by the Holy Spirit to author canon. Okay, they were not personally trained by Jesus. They not, he was not around from the time of John the Baptist. None of that stuff. But they come to faith and they're called to plant churches, to preach the gospel, and they are called, obviously, to expound the scriptures. The only kind of apostle that exists today is the Apollos kind. Now, even there, be careful. Jesus sent the apostles out in pairs in Matthew chapter 10. When the Holy Spirit commissioned the ministry to the Gentiles in Acts 13, we're told they were fasting and praying, the elders and leaders and so forth. And the Holy Spirit said, set out for me Barnabas and Saul. Two, two. Be careful of any apostolic authority that is monarchical, that is monoepiscopal, that this is the head honcho, he's the guy, he's over. Be careful. This doctrine of monoepiscopacy was developed by Ignatius of Antioch in the second century. It is alien to the New Testament. When apostolic authority in any form was exercised in Scripture, it was dual. It was dual. Where Peter writes in his epistle, remember, he says things that are complicated and difficult to understand, that the untaught distort that our brother Paul explained, according to the wisdom given him, Notice that Peter endorses Paul's ministry. Here we see that Paul echoes John's teaching. Okay. Uh, there's no one man show. You see these people going around today. In England, it was called restorationism. Today, it's called the New Apostolic Reformation. It doesn't matter what you call it, they're not restoring anything except error, and it's not new. Look with me, please, to Revelation chapter 1. I'm sorry, chapter 2. Verse 2, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, but they are not. These people have always been around. It doesn't matter if it's the Gerald Coates and Terry Virgos in England saying they have an apostolic ministry or if it's the Bill Johnson and the NAR. It doesn't matter. They've always been around. They can call it the new apostolic reformation. It's the old apostolic impersonation. This garbage, this poison has always been around. Now, we'll see this next week. They try to poison you. They try to persuade you with their speech. Next week, we're going to have to give a little bit more attention to the Greek than we did tonight. But let's look at this. Now, there is something we need to point out about the original apostles who saw the Lord. In Ephesians 4, remember, Ephesians is the partner of Colossians. In Ephesians 4, we are told he gave gifts, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, 
some pastors and teachers. Actually, in the Greek, pastors and teachers are fused. Somebody can be a teacher without being a pastor, but somebody cannot be a pastor unless they can teach. That doesn't mean they're a theologian or a scholar or an expositor, but it means that they are exegetically competent to expound the scriptures. You cannot be a pastor if you cannot teach. He gave these things. What you see today very often is people saying something that is a combination of spiritual pride and ignorance. And I've heard people say it, and maybe you have. It goes something like this. I believe I have the five-fold ministry. <laughs> they think they're an evangelist, and they think they're a pastor, and they think that actually they're <laughs> First of all, if they knew Greek, they know it could be interpreted as a fourfold ministry, but that's that's only one aspect of their dilemma or the dilemma of those who pay attention to such people. Obviously, there's ignorance and the spiritual pride in this, as we've said, but let's look at this. If somebody is holding all the cards, what do you need a deck for? What do you... If somebody has all the gifts, what do we need a body for? Leadership is always plural in scripture. Look at Acts 13, look at Acts 2. Leadership is always plural. You have this church model. Well, who's your pastor? Well, Reverend Douglas. Okay, well, who's your teacher? Reverend Douglas. Does the Lord ever speak prophetically to your church? Yes. Well, who does he speak prophetically through? Well, Reverend Douglas. Well, you ever have gospel meetings? Yes. Every Sunday night. Who preaches the gospel? Well, Reverend Douglas. That's what we pray him, pay him for. <laughs> he got the five-fold ministry. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Until he understands the scripture, he shouldn't have any ministry. Uh, this is this is this is all nonsense. However, the original apostles who saw Jesus, the 12 and Paul, the original apostles did have it all. They were apostles, they were prophets, they were pastors, teachers, evangelists, they were, but they were unique for that time. They were unique for that time. Yes, Paul and Peter, the original apostles, John, they, they were that. But they're the only ones who were that. The only kind of apostle you have now is the Apollos kind, church planting missionaries. And if they're real, they will go out in pairs, ideally. Be careful of one man shows. Now, this subject of apostolic authority is a, obviously a subject in itself. I gave you a nutshell answer to a question insofar as it related to tonight. Well, thank you for that, Jacob. That was excellent. Um, of course, we know that in 2 Corinthians 11, uh, uh, he Paul talks about what qualifies uh, someone to be a false apostle, and that's them claiming to be equal to yes. the, the foundational apostles and I have a whole list of people in the New Apostolic Reformation yeah. who have not only yeah. said they're equal to, they're saying, they're saying they're greater than. This stuff is not new. <laughs> um, can I uh, have uh, Sarah Leslie uh, ask you a question? She's got I'm not doing anything with Sarah and Lynn. I love them. <laughs> hey there. <laughs> Hello, sister. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Well, uh, all the better for seeing you in your Mennonite bonnet. Are you wearing it tonight? Oh, <laughs> well, sort of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and is Lynn uh, wearing his? Is Lynn wearing his <laughs> suspenders? His brace? His braces? No, no, no. He's not wearing suspenders. He's working out of the home now, so he can kind of dress informally these days. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I got a I question. Him with with the, you got to be understand something in England. <laughs> suspenders are called. Braces, braces. But it, yes. Suspenders are a thing that a woman, a lady uses on a, a 
a, a, a garter to hold up stockings. <laughs> <laughs> I speak American English and I speak English English. <laughs> never, never you gotta keep three. it straight. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm listening. All right, I got a question. Um, I was reading verses five and six, and it says that you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, and then it goes on in verse six and says, that is what bringeth forth fruit. And the thing that crossed my mind when I read it, especially as you went through the rest of the chapter, is if you don't have the truth of the gospel, the word of the truth of the gospel, you're going to have fake fruit. Of course, nothing. Yeah, I, and so That's I wondered true. if you would address what fake fruit is, because we've all seen a lot of fake fruit in our Christian walk. Okay. I'll give you an example of fake, fake fruit. A false repentance. A fake fruit is where somebody says they're sorry for doing something wrong, but there's no turning away from it. They do the same thing again habitually with no sense that they got to turn from it. That's a fake fruit of repentance. Let's look at a fake fruit of, uh, of souls. Okay. Jesus warned the Pharisees that they went to the ends of the earth to make one convert, and they became twice as much a son of hell as they used to be, okay? There are groups. I got saved through the children of God. I actually had a born-again experience through a cult for the children of God. In the long term, that cult made those hippies more sons of hell than they used to be. Now, God might have been gracious and got people out of it into other churches and things, but the ones who stayed in it, that is a false fruit. Let's look at another one. A false fruit of the spirit. When people run on emotions, and they'll, yeah. here, I'll give you an example. People see something wrong that's hurting the body. Oh, but we shouldn't judge. We just have to love. We shouldn't criticize. That's not the fruit of the spirit. <laughs> so Paul was wrong, and, and you know, and, and and John was wrong in his epistles. You know, and, and you, you no, know, we shouldn't say who these people are who mislead the church. That's not loving. We should just teach the truth. Let God deal with the error. Okay, so when the apostles were said, that's Diotrephes. Look out for them. And look out for Alexander the coppersmith. And look out for Philates and Hymenaeus. The apostles were wrong. They didn't have the fruit of the spirit. They should have let the church be wrecked with havoc instead of standing up. Oh, we just have to be careful of people who have this emotional pseudo-spirituality. And it's very prominent among many charismatics. Okay? That is an example of the false fruit of the spirit. They think that Love and kindness and gender. How, how can you let a baby put something in his mouth that's going to choke him? Because, because he's going to cry if you take it away from him. Or, or let a little kid play with an electrical device. That's not love. Well, that is an example of false fruit. Okay? And then works not wrought of God. Works mm -hmm. not wrought of God. My family, my wife and kids are Israeli. I love Israel and, and the Jewish people. Um, I understand Christianity as a Hebraic faith that was made open to non-Jews, but it came from Israel. Salvation came from the Jews. The scriptures, both testaments, are written by Jewish authors and so forth. And I believe in the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews. I believe replacement theology is a false doctrine. And I believe that contemporary events in the Middle East are of prophetic significance in heralding the return of Christ. I believe all of that and more. But I've seen people that the real ambassadors of Christ, Paul says, are those who preach the gospel. We are ambassadors. There's an organization that dares to call itself a Christian embassy that has a non-evangelistic policy. They actually say, we're just going to bless Israel with social programs and political support and let God save them and things. They get into dual covenant theology, some of them, thinking that Jews can be saved under the law. No, 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 no. Paul says, and he says it specifically concerning the Jews, with no preacher, how shall they hear? 
specifically concerning the Jews, Ezekiel says, if you don't warn them, I'm going to require your blood from their hands. Mm -hmm. These people called bridges for peace. If there's no Jesus, there's no bridge for peace. He is our peace between Jew and Gentile. He's our peace. We shall be one. He's our peace. No Christ, no peace. It's the gospel. Paul says, shod your feet with the shoes of the gospel of peace. Isaiah says, the gospel of peace. Ephesians 6, it's the gospel of peace. There's no gospel, there's no peace. So you see false works, the false fruit of works, that the, that, that the works are, are false, that the repentance is false, that the uh, conversions are not based on biblical discipleship, and a lot more. There's plenty of false fruit, and I'm sorry to say we live in an age and a time, although it's happened in other ages, where there's also a lot of rotten fruit. Uh, Michael was asking, can Jacob elaborate more on how the fall affected heaven? I can. The Old Testament saints, before Jesus came, when they gave up the ghost, they couldn't get in. They had to go to the bosom of Abraham and wait, okay, until the Messiah came and died for sin. That was one. Second is satanic access, satanic access. Satan is the most powerful angel God created. He is so powerful, he thought he could usurp the place of God. Ezekiel 28, <clears throat> so forth. Um, Isaiah 14, that's how powerful he is. He has access to the throne. He's the accuser of the brethren. He accuses us before the throne. One of the reasons there must be a new heaven and a new earth is that reason. He will not have any access to the new one, and he will be cast out of the present one in the battle in Revelation with Michael. He was like unto God, okay? He'll be cast out. When he's cast out, though, he comes to earth and he becomes incarnated, as it were, inside the Antichrist. The Antichrist will essentially be Satan incarnate, in effect, with very close approximation of that. Um, so those are the <clears throat> those are the reasons. Now in Hebrews we're told about the temple needing to be cleansed. Remember the Mekudesh, the Mekudesh, and it talks about oh, I'm thinking of Hebrew, the making holy, the rituals of Yom Kippur that the outer temple, I think it's chapter nine, had to be cleansed and things like that. But these are copies of things in heaven. These are copies. Verse 20, Hebrews 9, verse 23. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of these things in the heavens to be cleansed with these. But the heaven stains themselves with better sacrifices than these. Notice the copies of the things on earth. What we have on, what the Hebrews had on earth in the Levitical sacrificial system were copies of things in the heavens to be cleansed with these. But the heavenly things themselves are better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. Nor was it that any would um, offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place, hereby yet meaning Yom Kippur, with blood <coughs> That blood that is not his own. Um, the earthly temple had to undergo a cleaning ritual, as did the Holy Ark. The priests had to undergo this sanctification ritual called Mekudesh. Okay? Uh, they, they had to do Mekudesh. They had to go through this. Because these things were a copy of things in heaven. They were a copy of things that were in the heavenlies. Okay? So, what you see on earth is a reflection of what 
is in the heavens, but on earth it's defiled. In heaven, it was inenterable. It was inenterable because of sin. People couldn't enter it until Christ came. So heaven is affected by what happened on earth. Heaven is affected with the fall of man and what happened on earth. Satanic access, uh, the inability of man to enter the, the holy places in heaven because that, that's why only the high priest could enter on Yom Kippur. He couldn't enter the copy because people did not have access to what was in heaven. Um, again, we're barred. We're barred. And ultimately, of course, there's a battle in heaven. Daniel and Revelation relate the battle on earth to the battle in heaven. They relate the two. These things you happen to see happening in the Middle East very much with Iran and so forth or Daniel chapter 10, they're a reflection of the battle going on in heaven. The battles we see politically and strategically now are only a reflection of what's happening in heaven. There's a battle in heaven right now between the demonic and the angelic, between Jesus and the devil. In heaven, there's a battle right now. Uh, he's up there accusing us the way he accused Job, the way he accused Zerubbabel and, and Jehoshua in uh, Zechariah, that's the way he accuses us. Uh, it's, it's defiling, and it has ramifications for us, and what we do has ramifications for heaven. But this is all going to change. I hope that clarifies it a bit. Does it make sense? Yeah, definitely makes sense. I guess maybe we should cut this off at this point and uh, just have a time of fellowship and unless you're wanting to address something else, Jacob. No, that's good, but please um, join us on Sunday. I'm sorry, Saturday night, UK time, which will be 11 if you're a night owl. It'll be earlier in the United States. And we'll be looking at the rebellion of Sheba on Sunday. It'll be one in, one o'clock in Hawaii on Saturday. It'll be three in California, four in the Denver, five in Chicago, six in New York, 11 in uh, Great Britain and Europe. It will be midnight. It would be really ridiculous. But it be for the people in Australia, in Western Australia and Singapore, it will be seven, and then it will be 10, and then like noontime in New Zealand. That is next Saturday, or if you live in Australia, New Zealand, Sunday morning, uh, we'll be looking at the Rebellion of Sheba, it's a different kind of a format than this. It's a different kind of a teaching. It'll follow the one we did last Saturday, which was divine aristocracy. This is a Bible study. Um, we'll be here next week, Lord willing, same time for the continuation of Colossians. We do chapter two next week, which is the heart of what Colossians means for us now in practical terms. Lord willing, we will see you then, and Lord willing, we'll get this glitch fixed. Uh, with the live streaming. Uh, this has been a, a perpetual problem. Also, we have a video available on Moriel that we got from another ministry, and it's about spiritual abuse, spiritual abuse. We would encourage everyone to watch it. For more information about Moriel, check out our website, www.moriel.org.